hearts for his children today. So would you pray with me? Lord God, we love you. We are so grateful for the gift of your son for freedom and life in you. The life that we have in Jesus by the power of your spirit. And so we ask that by the power of that same spirit, would you open our ears and our hearts once more to receive the good news of life and freedom that is in you. Would you speak to us by your word this morning? All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you remain standing as Carrie reads the word for us this morning? Good morning. Today's reading comes from Peter's first letter to the scattered believers. We begin in chapter 2, verse 9. He says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may, um, they see, will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that, mm, sorry, that by doing good, you would silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. The word of the Lord. So go ahead and have a seat. Again, my name is Brody and kids, this is the kids sermon. And it's not often that I get to do the kids sermon and perhaps in a minute you'll figure out why. But Miss Andrea is helping in the nursery today, so she's kind of coached me up, and this uh, time is for you. So this is kind of an interesting Sunday. It's an interesting Sunday because it is not just a Sunday where we gather and worship, but it is also the 4th of July. This is, the, uh, this is Independence Day. This is a day that we remember the birth of our nation. And it is kind of an important time to remember how God has provided for us in many ways. So there was an important church leader that lived like 500 years ago named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther had a teaching about how we can understand the relationship that we experience as citizens of a nation and also citizens of his kingdom. He talked about it this way. He said there is a kingdom on the left hand a left-handed kingdom that is the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of the state, the kingdom of law. And what uh, he taught was that God has instituted this kingdom for our good. And so it is worth uh, our time and our energy to celebrate things like our country on a day where we remember the birth of our country. We wear our patriotic colors um, many people are wearing uh, red, white, and blue today. We're going to go to parades and eat cookouts and go see fireworks tonight. And it is good, but we do that because we remember that God has blessed us by providing government so that we can 
uh, see all humanity flourish. And in this country, we are particularly lucky that we get to uh, interact with the government and help choose the people who lead us. In the times of the Bible, when the Apostle Peter was writing what was read for us just a moment ago, they did not live in such generous uh, governments. And, and, and so it is a day worth remembering and celebrating what God has done for us by providing for us in this left-handed kingdom. But this is also a Sunday, And on Sunday, we come and we uh, gather around what God calls the right-handed kingdom, the kingdom of God. And on Sundays, it is worth our time and our energy and our attention to come and celebrate how God has provided for our freedom through the gospel, through the forgiveness of sins. And so we sing our songs, and sometimes we wear special clothing to recognize what God has provided for us in this right-handed kingdom. See, we can give thanks to God because God has provided the left-handed kingdom and all the freedoms that we enjoy in this country, and we celebrate those today. But today is also a Sunday, and God has provided us this right-handed kingdom, this kingdom of God, where we can come and celebrate what God has done by forgiving our sins and setting us free. So let us pray and thank God for all the freedoms that God has given us. Lord, we give you thanks for how you provide for us both in our nation and in the kingdom of God by setting us free. We give you thanks for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning again, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here with you. If I missed you at the start of the service, if you tuned in maybe after the beginning, my name is Steve Turnbull. I'm your senior pastor here at ULC and really fun uh, to be here in worship. It's Sunday. It's a holiday for Christians every week and it's the 4th of July. It's a holiday in our country. I learned from Pastor Brody this morning about the kingdom of the left hand where all the artists who write funny, they all live in that kingdom. And then there's a... a, uh, I'm just kidding about that. Are you you left-handed? I don't remember. (laughs) You are. Yeah, that's right. Um... It is uh, uh, left hand in your right mind, that's right. It is great to be here uh, with you this morning. We gather together for worship on a Sunday morning like this, uh, and specifically here in this place in the middle of Ohio, in the middle of the United States of America. I am not much of a betting man, but if I were going to make a wager, I bet the odds are pretty good that most of the people in this room would describe ourselves with these two adjectives in common. I bet nearly all of us who are here would call ourselves both Christians and Americans. We'd take probably both those things. I bet most of us who are here for worship would call ourselves Christians. In the biblical definition, we would we confess that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. He's actually the living Lord of heaven and earth. We've given Jesus our faith and our loyalty and believe that he has forgiven our sins, our offenses against him, has given us his grace and the promise of eternal life. And thanks be to God for this. And if you're here this morning and that's not you, welcome. I'm really glad that you're here. If you have questions, if your neighbor brought you before they took you to the parade or something like that, uh, thanks for coming. I'm really glad and I hope that this can be a blessing to you and you'll learn and grow because of this. If you have any questions, I'd love to be able to help you with that. I imagine most of us who are here probably also call ourselves Americans or at least find ourselves in America for sure at this moment right now. I, I would guess that most of us have been born here. I was. Some of us may be new Americans of one kind or another, maybe naturalized citizens. Uh, That's also kind of my own family story. I've got both sides. On my dad's side, uh, my people are from a small town in southeastern Ohio for a number of generations. We were coal miners in Shawnee. Uh, On my mom's side, my mom immigrated to the United States as a child. She and her family moved here uh, from uh, in the post-World War II era. Her mom was from Bavaria in southern Germany, and her dad grew up on a farm outside of Riga, Latvia. And so I grew up kind of with an old world family with a whole bunch of people on my mom's side who were not born here and uh, were immigrants to the United States, learned lots of different languages, or her, I didn't learn them, I heard lots of different languages growing up. And my grandfather was one of the proudest Americans you could ever meet. He was so grateful, so glad for the opportunity that was afforded to him in this country to make a new life, to give himself and his family new opportunity. And the benefit of that opportunity that he got accrues to me. (laughs) And I am so grateful for the course of life uh, that he and they were able to walk. 
The question that I'm wanting to ask and, and think about with you this morning and hopefully share some of the light of the gospel and the wisdom of scripture for is how are those two things related? How, how is it related that we are Christians and Americans? And if you are not either of those things, I hope this continues to build you up also. Or in the promo materials that we kind of designed uh, for this Sunday, and some of you may have seen, we asked the question this way, what does loving Jesus have to do with loving your country? And we sent an email out with that subject line, and uh, more than usual, a few people responded to that email and gave me the answer to the question. So that was fun to engage with you. Thank you for that. Um, and in fact, one of those answers actually is pretty similar to something I'm going to say in a few minutes. What does loving Jesus have to do with loving your country? You know, that's a question that on the one hand is actually kind of an easy question. There's a side to that question anyway that's pretty simple. There are also sides to that question that are kind of hard and kind of complicated. The, the easy side of the question is that loving Jesus comes first. That being a Christian is more important than being a citizen of any nation in this world. That our loyalty to the Lord Jesus comes ahead of our loyalty to any club, any society, any culture, any country. If you were ever a part of any group, even a country, a state, a club, anything, and they asked you to do something and Jesus said to do something different, as Christians we know whom we have called Lord. And in fact, you can't call Jesus Lord and then put him second to anything. That's the literal definition of idolatry. And so while that's challenging, that's the simple side of things. The more complicated and honestly, in my mind, more interesting side of things is to then ask, well, how do we then think and act with regard to all the things that come second? How, how are we then Americans? How are we followers of Jesus? And how do we follow Jesus in the context of our citizenship, our residency here in this country? And that is more complicated. And honestly, I, that's a conversation that I hope Christians with different perspectives and wisdom and insight and intelligence formed by Scripture, living in light of the gospel of Jesus, will continue to have with one another to discern how our followership to Jesus continues to play itself out with implications for our citizenship in this country and followers of Jesus around the world would have this conversation with discernment in the Spirit for how their discipleship to Jesus has implications for their citizenship in any nation in the world. What I hope to do today is to share with you a little bit of teaching that I hope will provide you with some equipping, provide you with, say, a, a jumping off point, a foundation, some guidelines, whatever is helpful to foster that conversation, to help us grow in our faith and our loyalty to Jesus, our wisdom as Christians, and as a blessing to one another in our country. So I'm going to give you three words. I don't always do this, but I'm going to give you three words that all start with the same letter that I hope might be a little bit memorable and might provide some help to you uh, as we all sort out what it means to follow Jesus in the context of this weekend and our citizenship in this country. So those three words that I'm going to share with you this morning are these. Uh, boundary, bounty, and blessing. How do we see the boundary and give thanks for the bounty and then seek to be a blessing to one another and to the country in which we live? So let me start here. First of all, we see the boundary. And in many ways, this is actually what I've already said. This is recognizing that our loyalty to, our faith in Jesus comes first before anything else at all. Let me remind you of a few things that we read in this letter called 1 Peter this morning. So this is a letter that was written by one of Jesus' apostles whose name was Peter to scattered disciples of Jesus uh, in the first century, probably some of whom were Jewish, probably some of whom were citizens of other nations, some Gentiles. And uh, he wrote this to them. He said, but you are a chosen people, which was a phrase that would have applied to God's people, the Israelites, in the Old Testament. You are a royal priesthood. Priesthood means you represent God to other people. You represent God to the world. You are a holy nation. You people who come from a variety of nations are a holy nation together. You are God's special possession. That's a, a, translated differently in different translations. A, a people of God's own possession. Right, Kerry? God's special possession. That's a phrase that was applied uh, in the Old Testament, again, to the Israelites. And it doesn't just mean like most beloved or most special or something. But this was a term uh, in Old Testament times that was used 
in secular covenants or secular treaties where one really powerful king that was creating a larger kingdom or empire might conquer a smaller, like, vassal kingdom, and they could be called my special possession. And what it means is that, like, I'm not going to conquer you again. I'm not going to destroy you, but I'll protect you, maybe even provide some provision. You'll be loyal to me. In a secular context, you'll send your tribute and your taxes back to me, but we've got a special relationship, and I'll take care of you, and you're loyal to me. And now Peter replies, that's, uh, that's in the Old Testament, God calls Israel by that name, and now the Apostle Peter is applying that name to all God's people who follow Jesus, so that you may declare the praises of him, so that you may glorify him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And then just a little bit later, he calls them foreigners and exiles. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles in the country in which you live, you're actually from another place. You're a a holy nation. There's a boundary that the Bible imagines between our identity as the people of God and our identity in any other place. When Jesus came in ancient Galilee declaring the gospel, the Bible tells us he came proclaiming the good news of God, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. So turn around and believe this good news. Repent and believe this good news. He declared the kingdom of God arriving in that moment to a place, to people who already believed that they were living in the kingdom of Israel, although they were at that time under the authority of a greater kingdom or empire of Rome. But now the kingdom of God is coming among you and welcomes anybody who will turn to it. There's another place in one of the books of the Bible that was originally a letter we now call the book of Philippians. And it was a letter the apostle Paul wrote to Christians who were living in the city of Philippi which was a city that had a distinguished status among other cities in the Roman Empire. Philippi was an honest-to-goodness Roman colony, and citizenship in Rome and loyalty to Rome was an especially high value in Philippi. And in the letter to the Philippians, Paul reminded them, these followers of Jesus, who had been baptized into the family of God. He said, your citizenship is in heaven, and we await a savior from there. He was using real loaded language for them in that context. Many in Philippi understood what it was to look for a savior to protect them. This word wasn't a word that the Christians had taught them. They knew what saviors were. Their names were things like Julius Caesar and Pompey and Augustus and Tiberius. They were known as saviors because they saved cities and colonies and other provinces from poverty by providing bread and safe agriculture and firm borders and protect them from foreign invasions. They were saviors. But Paul told the Philippians, Your citizenship is in heaven, and you are awaiting a savior from there. All over the Bible is the assumption, and sometimes the explicit teaching, that there's a boundary, there's a distinct identity that comes with being part of God's people, God's holy nation, God's special possession, God's kingdom, that's different than being a part of any other kingdom or tribe or province or nation around the world. But this does not come in the Bible to us with any kind of scolding tone. This doesn't come with any chastisement. This comes as fantastic news. This is news for which we can be immensely grateful and for which we can rejoice for at least two reasons. One, the kingdom of God will never fall. It will never end. It cannot be shaken. I'm not much of a historian, but when I study history, I know that not any nation, not any country, not any state, not any empire, not any kingdom has ever lasted forever. Everyone has fallen, everyone has had to be raised up again, everyone has come into being new again. This is the way of history. They all fall, but the kingdom of God never will. And when we are a part of it, we are part of something that cannot be shaken, something that will last forever. You are a part of a kingdom that cannot be threatened. You are a part of the people of God that will endure even after you die. Even after everything in earth would pass away, you are still part of the people of God that will last forever. Thanks be to God for this unshakable gift. And not only is it permanent, not only can death not undo it, it is permanent and it is pervasively good. It is thoroughly good. I am grateful to live in a a secular country that aspires to provide liberty and justice for all. Not every country in history nor around the world has even identified this as something toward which we aspire. Have we accomplished it yet? Are we fully there? Is is freedom and liberty and justice provided equally for all people? We're not there yet. As Christians, we would expect no less. Of course, we're not there yet. We'll never be perfect on this side of eternity. 
but the kingdom of God is. And the risen Jesus has come to offer us forgiveness for our sins, forgiveness for our offenses against one another, and also the Holy Spirit to heal our way of life. And the risen Jesus promises that he is the foretaste of God's new creation. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit is the beachhead, the oasis of God's kingdom, which will one day be all good all the time. We get to be a part of something that cannot be shaken, that will last forever, and is thoroughly good for all people always. Thanks be to God for this. When we see the boundary, we see how good is the promise of God to us. And then I think in seeing it, this sets us free. This gives us tremendous freedom for the next two things. The first of which is to give thanks for the bounty. <laughs> so much bounty we enjoy. So much goodness, so much blessing for which to be grateful. And those of us who live here in this country, even the very land upon which we stand, just the natural resources that come to us in abundance, the natural beauty of which so many songs have been written that we enjoy from sea to shining sea and purple mountain majesty and all the amber waves of grain, so much natural resource, so much natural beauty, and there's no reason we should be anything but grateful for the bounty. Not just the natural resources, but the people. The people who have come before us, the people who are around us even now, people who have been so full of innovation, hard work, and high ideals, so much that we can be grateful for, and we can be grateful for the bounty. I, for one, am immensely grateful. I am grateful to be an American, to stand on the shoulders and on the trajectory of so much that has come before me. We can be grateful for the bounty. Interestingly enough, I think sometimes it feels complicated to feel grateful. We might feel guilty for feeling grateful because we know that there are still problems. We know that so much is still wrong. We know, among other things, that the bounty has not been equally shared. I can speak for myself. I won't even have to speak for anybody else. You can decide if this applies to you. I have way more than my share of the bounty. I get way more than, than the share of the bounty that I deserve. I know this. And my hands, we are spoiled, are we not? And my hands are not even clean in this regard. I don't share in the way that I probably should. This has been true in history, and this is true in the present. And so we may feel guilty in our gratitude. And yet the Bible teaches us to go on being grateful. It teaches us to be grateful to God in all circumstances. We just finished a series on the book of Ephesians, and in our reading in the last week of the series, we read the instruction that as we are filled with the Spirit, we, one of the results of that is that we will give thanks to God the Father in Jesus Christ in everything. I think we are free in Christ to give thanks that we should not, on top of all the other problems that we experience, and, and by the way, should not we as Christians be the people who are least of all surprised that there is ongoing problem? That, there, that I have more than my share of the bounty, that it's not evenly shared. We know that in this life we are sinners. We come to worship every week and we confess our own sins. We confess our finiteness and we are humbled before God and know that we live only by His grace and by His power. And yet in this grace we are set free to give thanks for what we do have. That we would not compound our errors by adding this to all of them, the experience of ingratitude. So I think we can give thanks for the bounty. And as you go around today, and maybe you're at some parades, and maybe you're at parties and cookouts and celebrations, and people are thankful and proud of the place where we live and give thanks for the bounty, I think we as Christians are free to participate and to participate with enthusiasm. And we know to whom it is that we give thanks. We give thanks for the bounty. And then finally, we see the boundary, give thanks for the bounty, and then work to be a blessing. Work to be a blessing to the place where we live. In the Old Testament, God's people Israel were at one time viciously conquered. Their nation was destroyed, their city was torn down, their temple was torn down. It was a tragedy. And they were carried off in exile to a foreign place called Babylon, a pagan place, and they were at the bottom of the heap. And they got a word from God through the prophet Jeremiah who told them to pray for the peace, the shalom, the flourishing of the country where they found themselves. I imagine that actually wasn't an easy word for them to hear from Jeremiah. Pray for the peace of the city where you are. And in fact, he said, get married, have kids, plant gardens, raise up families, get jobs, work. Work for the good of the place where you find yourself. You're going to be there for a while as foreigners and exiles. If that word was spoken to God's people in the Old Testament in such a horrible place, I think we could hear something ourselves. Pray for the peace. Work 
for the flourishing of the place where we find ourselves. We uh, find this instruction even in the letter to 1 Peter that we just heard, and in a maybe a little bit different way. Live such good lives among the pagans. Live such good lives among those who don't know or honor God that they would see your good deeds and then give honor to God. And in fact, honor the emperor. Be obedient to the civil authorities. Be part of the country where you live. Now, of course, when that comes in conflict with, what, with the one who you, whom you call Lord, we see the examples in the Bible where choices of loyalty had to be made. But they're instructed to be good citizens and to live lives that bring honor to God among themselves. We and among the world in which they live. I think even as we give thanks for what we have and recognize that we're not all the way there yet, we can participate in working to make it a better place. And many of you will do this in lots of different ways. Some of you will do this by working in structural ways. Maybe some of you have held public office locally or further, worked as part of our government. Maybe you've worked for agencies or offices that support the, support the government in which we live, local, state, or at a national level. Thanks for that good work. You work beside people who don't know or honor God, you can work alongside them for the good that we share. Brody called it the kingdom on the left. We can do this work and honor God by the way that we do it. But most of us won't do it that way. We, maybe you'll work in nonprofits, work in volunteer agencies, work for the relief of those who aren't getting their share of the bounty. Good for you. Thanks for doing it. Maybe it'll be in all kinds of quiet ways. Because America isn't just a structure. America isn't a government. America is a people. It's a very large community made up of a whole lot of very small communities. And one of the ways that you'll work to be a blessing to our country, to the place we find ourselves, is by the way you treat your literal neighbor, simply the person who lives in the house next door. By loving and knowing the people who take other wa to walk around the neighborhood and you run into them. By the ways that you raise children and work with integrity and industry in your job. The ways that you make the place around you a better place. We can see the boundary and know where our salvation comes. We can give thanks to God for the incredible bounty that we enjoy. And then I think work for the good. Work for the blessing of the place that we are. I think this will work the best when it comes from a place of humility. When we are humble in ourselves, humble about our own abilities, humble about our own sinful fallen flesh, humble about ourselves, but supremely confident in the grace and the goodness and the power of God. And we cultivate this attitude as Christians every week in worship. And I'm gonna turn us into the practice that we share every week where we confess our sins before God habitually and develop the habit of hearing the good news of God's grace and freeing, liberating power in Jesus Christ. So let me lead us in this prayer, and I begin today as we always begin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me pray for us. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Bible teaches us